Okay. It's hourglassing, but it says I'm live. We'll see what happens. I'm just going to give it a minute. I always give it time to warm up. All right. Like I say, I'm a little bit late getting on tonight. I uh, had some things to do today. Karen had a doctor's appointment, so I had to go and take her to the doctor. She's not allowed to drive yet. She's not been released um, after her surgery. Um, we got a good report from the surgeon. Everything's healing up fine, but still got some time to heal. So she'll be uncomfortable for a little while longer um, as she recovers from this surgery. Then we'll be able to start some of the different procedures and then eventually hopefully have either the second and maybe a third surgery, but it's all working in the right direction, which is good. Uh, like I said, a lot of things went on today. It's been a long day. I'm slow getting here and I apologize for the delay. Um, it was interesting. I did stopped after the doctor's appointment. I wanted to pick up some things up at Office Depot um, for the Samaritan's Purse and that turned into an ordeal that lasted over an hour and a half. Um, somehow my order managed to crash three cash registers. Was not that big of an order, <laughs> but for some reason their cash registers kept crashing. I ended up staying there for about an hour and a half. But the interesting thing is God uses that time for, to teach us things. And while I was standing in line, um, standing there waiting for them to work on my order, a lady was standing behind me in line and, and I was talking to the cash register, you know, cashier clerk. And we we're talking about, you know, I'm buying these things for Samaritans first, you know, church, you know, tries to do the different things for it. And the lady was standing behind me kind of listening. And she said, excuse me, let me show you something. And I thought, okay. So she pulls up her camera and, you know, she's got her mask on. I've got mine. So I didn't feel too bad. And she starts showing me pictures. She says, this is my brother in Florida. He's a doctor. And this is my sister here. And she's this and, you know, and I'm here. And we all came from a third world country. And she says, I want to tell you that what you are doing with Sir Farrington's purse does not go in vain. She says, it's a great thing and it makes a difference. And she says, all, my, all of us were able to get educations and eventually move to the United States and are living very well. So Samaritan's Purse makes a difference. And I thought it was really interesting to meet somebody while I was buying the stuff and God put her right there to tell me, hey, what you're doing is worth what you're doing. So I encourage you, if you haven't been working on the Samaritan's Purse stuff and all, get out there and purchase those things. Because so, there's a first, you know, Thing. I wish I would get the lady's name, but like I say, she was right there, and then she went and got in another line and got checked out since I was breaking all the cash registers from my order. Oh, well. All right, so let's say, let's look at a few announcements. Um, continue on Sunday morning, do our service. So like I say, come in, get a parking spot, um, turn your radio to 87.9, 89.7, excuse me, um, FM and listen to it. You can run your heater, you can run your air conditioner, or whatever you please, or you can leave your windows down and listen through the speaker if you're up close enough. Um, but like I said, we're going to continue that. If the weather's a problem, they are forecasting some rain this weekend. I'm not holding my breath about it because God's <laughs> they've had rain forecasted several Sundays and we've been right out there and God's blessed us. So we'll just see how God works it out. Um, like I said, we do have the um, carport that we can get up underneath with the broadcast in there if we wanted to do that. So, But we'll let you know through Facebook or the phone chain if something changes. But like I said, we're planning on being out there at 9 o'clock. Um, again, you know, during the week, typically on Tuesdays, you know, I try to do it earlier in the evening. I'm going to do the Bible studies. Um, so like I say, um, tune into those. If you miss them, of course, you can pull up Facebook and just click on Second Baptist and pull them up anytime and listen to them. Then um, also... Um, continue to sponsor the Methodist Church Food Bank um, as their needs are going to grow and we're coming into the holidays and a lot of different things going on there. Um, so, oh, excuse me, um, keep those donations coming in as we support that ministry of that church as they reach out to the community. Remember, we need to be in touch with the community. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're getting into the short roads with the Samaritans first. It won't be long. We'll have to get those boxes together. I think it's about the second, third week of November. We have to have it all done and turned in. So we need to be working on those. Get your donations. Get, get your box. We'll, we'll get the boxes out at some point. Tommy hasn't told me how we'll get those out. Um, so like I said, we'll do that. Um, but like I say, if you got items to bring for the Samaritans first, we're running behind on the donations. So anything you get, um, bring it in. Uh, remember, no toothpaste. No liquids of any kind, no candy of any kind, and nothing that has any kind of military insignia on it. We definitely don't want any of those type of things. Um, if you do, they'll sort them out and use them somewhere else, but we just don't need to be wasting. You don't need to be wasting money on items that won't get to the children. So focus in on those things. Um, like I say, if you're not sure what to get, and 
there's a list out on the internet. You can look up Samaritan first and items needed and different things for the shoe boxes. So like I said, let's work on that. Um, so we have that going on. And also I just want to share with you something um, that's for the children, um, children, young adults, and maybe even some of the adults. I'm not sure where they'll really be used, but um, so Glenda Akers, I believe is her last name. Um, her daughter works with me at work. Um, she passed away. She was on a prayer list um, a short while ago. Um, her daughter went through her estate and was cleaning out some things, and she was a collector of porcelain dolls, um, along with other things. And she had some dolls that had Christian themes to them. Um, and her daughter brought them to me at work and donated them to us. Um, they're not the type of dolls that you play with like a toy but they can be used to illustrate lessons. Um, there's one with Jesus walking on water. There's the Ascension. There's eight of them all together. Um, I brought them, dropped them off at the church this evening. Um, so at some point, you know, whenever we get back into the, doing the Sunday school lessons and other, you know, things, they may be a good visual or they may just make a nice display to put up somewhere. I'm not sure. Um, we'll have to figure out um, how that is, but she did make that donation to church and I thought that was very nice of her. She didn't have to, but she she just wanted to do something for us. So I thank her for that effort. Um, so let's um, have a word of prayer. Like say, prayer requests. Like say, Karen's doing well. Um, still got a lot of healing to go. Um, it was, like I said, a four-hour surgery. Um, HC, remember HC. Um, Jennifer had appointments this week. Um, we got different people. Um, Peggy um, having some nauseousness after her treatments. Um, so the like I say, remember Peggy Kane um, with her treatments that she's going through these things. And of course, we got others that are, you know, still rehabbing and going through different things. Um, so we just need to be in prayer for them. Also, all those that are shut in, um, we have people that are shut in, and that's also. Um, so, like I say, uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and seek God's you know, blessings upon these individuals and His direction for our lives. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just praise you and give you the glory. And Father, we just thank you. Father, it's interesting how you just put people in our lives to share, hey, what you're doing is a good thing. And, you know, it wasn't that they were singing my praise, but the fact that Samaritan person makes a difference. And it was just a real life, you know, meeting someone. We see the videos, see the tape, but to meet somebody that's been affected by all that is just wonderful. And Father, we just thank you for that encounter. And Father, we just pray that you'll just guide us, direct us, and show us your will. But Father, showing us our will doesn't do anything if we're not willing to do it. So Father, make us doers of your will. Make us doers, not hearers, and not just people that gain knowledge. And I like to call a lot of times Christians who do nothing are just fat Christians. They get all the, all the blessings from God, but they never do anything with them. Father, let us turn those blessings around and help other people and, ser and serve your, your will in our lives. And Father, we just pray that you'll just bless those on our prayer list. Father, we have a prayer list at the church, and we have others that are on our private prayer list. And Father, we just pray for them. I ask that you bless them. Father, there's many that are in need of healing as they've gone through procedures or undergoing through an illness or, you know, something's going on in their lives. Father, we just pray that you'll just heal their bodies and strengthen them, Lord, so they can get back to doing more for you. And Father, we have others who are going through testing, um, seeking answers. Um, for issues going on in their lives. And Father, we just pray that you just bless them and comfort them as they're going through the testing. The waiting is such a hard thing. It's hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. I've been through so much of that in my life and with Karen. And Father, we just pray that you just give them the patience and understanding that you're right there with them. There's no use to worry, no use to fret. You're going to carry them through whatever the task is before them. And Father, like I say, um, we just have others who have just got praises and getting good reports. And um, Howard had a wonderful report this week, the first of three um, that were, they're, they're seeking. I like say if he gets three good ports in a row, they're saying everything's good. So we got the first one, all's clear, and that's just a wonderful blessing for them. We just send that shout out of joy, Lord. And Father, we just pray also for those who are shut in, Father, that they can't get out because they're immune compromised or, you know, this is not safe for them with the virus right now. Father, comfort them and just let them know they're not alone. A lot of times it's easy to look around the four walls and feel like you're all alone, but Father, you're with them. And Father, just give them that peace that they're not alone, that you're with them right there. You know, and Father, they just need that comfort. And Father, may we reach out and minister to them in whatever way we can minister to them and bless them somehow, Lord. And Father, we pray for our nation. We're in the midst of election and chaos and 
all that's going on. I say chaos because it just seems like so much confusion. Father, we need guidance. Direct us and teach us, Lord. Just show us where it is we need to go. And Father, I pray for all the leaders, those that are elected and those that will be elected. Father, I pray that if any of them do not know Jesus, I pray that they'll find Jesus their Savior. And Father, I pray that our country will be led according to your will, that our leaders will seek out your will and do it. Father, let them not be swayed by mankind in this world, but let them be driven by your will as you put them in those positions. And Father, we just ask that you'll be with all those as the COVID virus continues, Lord. We just pray that you'll bless them. Heal their bodies, Lord. Father, we just pray this virus will go away, but we know things have to run their course, and we know that there's a purpose. And right now, we're seeing the best of people and the worst of people. Father, it just hurts me to see the worst of people come out because I know so many people are so much better. But Father, I know that also people have that innate sin nature within them. They don't know Jesus. And we, that even that know Jesus, still have to fight the flesh. And Father, we just... Pray that we can resist the temptations and the wills of the world, Father, and just seek your glory. And Father, let us as Christians lead the way and be excellent examples to show people how to deal with this pandemic, not to fret and worry and beat each other's throats, but to work together. And Father, we just pray for the divisions of our nation. It seems all the pandemic and all the crisis is just strengthened and heightened everybody's tensions and stress and it just magnifies everything father we just need this a calming we need your healing spirit upon the people lord father our spirits need healed and the only way they're going to be healed is if we can find jesus i know father you can bring peace in our land but father i pray that you bring salvation to our land more so than anything and Father, we pray for the church. Continue to bless us. And guys, we thank you for your leadership and guidance for us, Father, to navigate our way through the pandemic. And Father, you blessed us with Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday of no rain and bad weather. And Oh, yeah, sometimes the heat's uncomfortable, the pool's uncomfortable. But Father, it's just for a short time, and it's worth it. It's worth it to get out there. And I just thank you for the opportunity to be out there and worship together. And Father, I thank you that we're utilizing technology to do Bible studies for our Bible studies we're reaching out further we're reaching more people than we've reached before in some cases with our Bible studies so I look at the names and there's new faces out there and new names sometimes that show up Father I just thank you that we can reach them and Father I pray that they're blessed and drawn closer to you Father bless this Bible study this evening let all that we do be to your glory in the precious name of Jesus we pray Amen and Amen all right so with this, we're going to get into it. And last time we started into chapter 10, we really just got the first five verses. Um, and so we're going to be talking about, in those five verses, we talked about the 45 years of peace that God had given Israel, not knowing how much about, you know, we don't know much about the two judges. Um, the two judges were Tola and Jair, other than the presumption that they must obey God for, you know, Israel to have 45 years of peace under them. We don't know much more than that. Um, matter of fact, even said Jair had 30 sons that had 30, 30 donkeys and that ruled over 30 cities. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> the little tidbits you get sometimes, and that's much it is. Um, so, like I say, um, but once the peace came in, once you get past Tola and Jair, you go into a deterioration again. And that's where we're going to pick up this evening. So, look with Judges chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtra, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years all the children of Israel were on the other side of Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over the Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim. So Israel was sore distressed. So like I say, we have the first two judges for the 45 years, Tola and Jair, that pass. And rather than learning from worshiping God and following God's ways during those 40 years, 45 years, what do they do? They benefit during those 45 years. 
and it's interesting what happens during times of good of good times. You know, 45 years, and then after that, they go after what we think will be greener pastures. Think about this. They've served God, been under leadership of God for 45 years. That comes to an end as these two pass, and rather continue it, what they do. You know what? Our neighbors do this, and our neighbors do that. Maybe they have it better than we did. How can you go through 45 years of peace and prosperity, and then all of a sudden, when it comes, the people pass, you say, yeah, hey, look at what our neighbors got. That's greed, that's lust, and God has blessed them, and they're not content with the blessing of God. And so what do they do? They look at what their neighbors have and the way their neighbors do it, and it appeals to their eye and to the flesh. But it's not going to benefit them in any way. So part of the worship, and now we understand what part of the worship is of Asher and Baal. What is so attractive about this? And it's truly a physical attraction in a lot of ways. <clears throat> Part of the worship of Baal and Asher involved temple prostitutes by both male and female. It wasn't just female prostitutes. A lot of times we think about prostitution only being down one side of the track. That is not the case here. They have both male and female prostitutes to serve all that come to worship. So like I say, it's, an, it's a very sensual worship that's part of it. It has an exotic allure, you could say. The second part of it is peer pressure. Now, we think about when we get on teenagers and kids, oh, you're bound down to peer pressure. Countries do it too. They look around and say, hey, look what they're doing, look what they're doing. You know, all their neighbors are sitting there where they're worshiping Baal, and they're over here worshiping Jehovah, which is a very strict worship and one that God holds them to a certain amount of laws and things that they can and can't do. And their neighbors are there saying, hey, you know, we can do these things. Our God allows us to worship this way. We can party. We can do all this. We have fun. And they're like, how come our God won't let us do that? And so what do they do? They go over and they start getting nosy. And for long, they look at what they're doing. They're saying, well, hey, they're doing living pretty good lives. And their things go, I'm going to go do like they do. They fall to the peer pressure because everybody around them is doing it. And so they say, well, we'll do it too. One of the things I remember reading years ago, and archaeologists may say, it's hard to find out how many gods Israel worshipped because so many times during their time period, such as in Judges, they would fall away from Jehovah and go worship other gods. And many times, even after this, during the time of the kings, you would have groups within Israel that would be following Asher and Baal, and other groups that would be following Jehovah, and they would cross over. And so when they do archaeological digs, they're like, who is it they're worshipping? Even the point that some people would put symbols of Jehovah on one side of a vase and symbols of Baal on the other side. And so a lot of times the archaeologists said Israel worshipped multiple gods. And in truth, they did. Here they list out, what, seven different gods or seven gods of seven countries that they went after. They wanted to be like everybody else. And so, like I say, peer pressure. They about wanted to be fit in. Isn't it interesting that you weigh your country's identity and you want to fit in with everybody else? Now, not wanting to leave anybody out Israel, like I say, they embraced all these different gods of seven different. God's reaction is not surprising, nor is it slow in this case. Um, but God immediately ends their peace with we'll state that it lasted 45 years. You know, you're going to go worship them? Fine. Let me just show you what's going to happen if you're going to worship their gods. And so he turns around, puts them under the authority of the Philistines and the Ammonites for 18 years. And he not only affects Israel on one side of the Jordan, but he brings the trouble over on the other side. So you have multiple tribes that are affected by it. We're talking about Judah, Ephraim, and Benjamin. So you have, they're attacking. Now, notice it's not the whole of Israel, but Israel is distressed because think about it, you're made up of 12 tribes and five, four, five, six of them are having problems and it's going to affect everybody. And so, like I say, need to be thinking of those things. You know, the problems that you bring on don't only affect you. A lot of times we don't think about one person in the home can create problems for everybody. And so it's important that we work together. Oh, excuse me. So like I say, here it is, 
we're dealing and really will for the rest of judges kind of deal with smaller sections of Israel. Um, right now we're kind of still over there in that section that we've been at and it's kind of still limited to Judah and Ephraim and all. But like I say, it has effects on a nation. You know, if you're having major problems in one part of the country, it affects the whole nation. We see that with major storms. You know, the Gulf Coast right now is preparing for another storm. Um, hurricane Delta, I believe. That'll be like, I think the third hurricane that's come through that, third or fourth hurricane that's come through the Gulf Coast. That'll be the 10th tropical storm that's hit the United States this year. It affects us. And you say, well, it's not affecting the people who are here. Indirectly, it affects you. But you also people you also see people reaching out to forest fires in California. It's going to affect everybody eventually. The resources that are being pushed that way and the things that it affects and you know, all as far as fruit and commerce, you'll see it directly or indirectly. But it affects the nation. But it does pull on us. If a country has to keep pushing its resources and pushing its resources into one part, it'll affect the whole nation. You know, if the army goes to war. The whole nation's affected by it because what do we do? The whole nation piles in behind it and supports the army as it goes to war. So here's that's sort of what you got going on. So here, like I say, um, it obviously affects the whole nation. Judges 10.10. 10. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. Okay. They've come to their senses to a point and they say, okay, we messed up. As Lord, we sinned against you because we've forsaken you and we serve Balaam. But there's no remorse really in this statement. It's just, okay, we, we, we messed up. So it's sort of like, okay, let's get back to where we need to be. And so like I say, they're not learning from their history. They're not learning from where they've been. If there's anything about history, it will repeat itself in a sense. And there's a lot of truth of it. If you don't learn from messing up, then you're going to make the same mistakes over and over again. The countries will do it, so do people. So like I say, the people have turned into false gods, their neighbors. And from the time of Othniel to the days of Gideon, the Jews endured over 50 painful years of oppression. So just going up to Gideon, we're talking about 50 years of oppression. But now that, you know, how many times has God pulled them out of it and blessed them? But they haven't learned. But they know where to go when they get in trouble. It's interesting. As long as things are good, don't worry about God. Things get tough, don't worry about God. And this is where we get in trouble as Christians. As long as things are good, we're okay. Things get tough. Oh, we go run to God. Why aren't we with God all the time? So many Christians only go to God when they got problems. So getting back to this, like I say, um, but God blessed them when they were obedient. But then they didn't they remember when they turned away from God how He chastised them when they were rebellious. Weren't all the times the covenant God made to Israel a covenant nation accepted in? See, we can go back and look at Joshua and everybody in Israel said, oh, yes, God, we're going to hold on to that covenant. We're going to do exactly what you say. We're going to follow it. And what happens? They turn away from it. They keep going away from it. For us, God chastens us in love. And we're suffering because of our sins. It's easy to cry for him deliverance and make all kinds of promises, but when we're comfortable and joyful, we don't. And see, but... We understand it. And this is why I say so many people take God and they put him on the shelf. When times are good, they put God on the shelf. They take the Bible, close it up, set it over on the shelf. Don't need God right now. Everything's good. Don't rock the boat. And then all of a sudden, something happens, an emergency, a problem, whatever. What do they do? Oh, let me go dust off my Bible. Let me start reading some scripture and let me start praying to God and crying out to him for deliverance. How did you think you got down the rabbit hole to start with, so to speak? When you walked away from God, who did you follow? God? No. You followed yourself. You followed your own ways, and you made yourself your own God. I'll do as I want to do. You called all the shots. 
And how many times is it going to take before you learn that when you call all the shots, how far down a rabbit hole you'll fall? How much trouble can you get in when you call all the shots? You're not consulting God's word. You're not using his wisdom. You're not consulting God. You're not asking his will. You're not looking for his will. You're not doing his will. You're calling the shots when things are going good. And because of that, that's why we get in so many trouble. And the thing that happens is times of prosperity, times of good times, creates weak character. And I can go into all kinds of different examples and different ways of looking at this. But think about it. As long as you don't have no problems, you're not being tested. If your fence never falls down, and as long as it's standing, you don't have to work on it. But boy, if your fence gets torn down by a stampede or whatever, and I'm just using a crazy example, right? Then you gotta go out there and put up all that fence. And that'll wear you out putting up a whole lot of fence. And what happens is all during that time when everything was good and all, you didn't have to do any fencing, you didn't have to do any kind of hard work like that. So your body got soft, you weren't in shape. The testing, the trials and all keep you strong. We have to endure some hardship. We have to endure some trials. We have to endure some temptations to keep ourselves spiritually strong. Our character won't be any good. There's a quote here. It says, happiness is not the end of the life. That's what Henry Ward Beecher said. Character is. But character is built when we make the right decisions in life, and those decisions are made on the basis of the things that we value most. Think about that. When you make your decisions, what justifies why you make your decision? Many people will justify and make their decisions based purely on what's in their wallet. Because that's what they value most. How many people truly pick up their Bible and say, this is what I value most and this is how I'm going to base my decisions? That's the difference. The more you base your decisions, what the scriptures tell you, and when the scriptures is what you value most, when serving God and giving God the glory is what you value most, you'll make better decisions. But until then, you're going to make decisions based on your other God, and that's what you like, what you want, and what you value most. And for most people, it's the almighty dollar. They'll take and they'll do whatever they can to get more dollars because that's what they value most. What are you basing your decisions on? Since Israel didn't value the things of God, what did they do? They made decisions on what made them happy. And they ended up destroying their own national character. So like I say here, the Lord is giving Israel victory over the seven nations. And we can go back and look it up. And that's what he's talking about in, in Judges 10, 11 through 12. He lists seven nations. God had gave them victory over those seven nations, those seven groups. And now what do they do? They turn around and they're worshiping the seven different pagan, the seven gods that these nations worship. Some of them worship similar gods or versions of them. They said, well, we're going to worship the gods of those that we defeated. What sense does that make? Those gods didn't save them when you went up against them, but now that everything's peaceful and calm, you're going to go worship those gods because you like it better the way they do it than the way God asks you to do it. Is it any wonder that God got so angry at Israel? It says he was hot against Israel. What foolishness to worship the gods of your defeated enemies. I mean, it makes no sense. God's just like, what are you thinking? And actually, the truth is they're not thinking. They're following the lust of their flesh, and that's what they're going after, what they value, and that is the pleasure of their flesh. And so Israel had to be chastened again. And this time, God sent the Philistines and Amorites to do this, and we're going to see the Philistines keep coming back around um, several different times. And like I say, the Amorites are distant relatives of Jews being descendants of Abraham's nephew, Lot. 
And so it must have given the leaders of Ammon and, and the Philistines a great joy that their old enemy Israel, and they oppressed them. Were they defeated for? Now they get to put them under the thumb. Nothing like a little bit of good, hey, got you back. And uh, so like I say, that's what we kind of going to see here. So they their armies came in, they invaded the area of Gilead, which is east of Jordan, and they crossed over and attacked Judah, Ephraim, and Benjamin. And it was a devastating, humiliating conquest. They just came in and took them. So let's pick up some more scripture here, chapter 10, verses 11 through 16. And the Lord, remember, verse 10, they say, cried out to God, Lord, we forsook you, and we're been worse than Baal. Here, here God said, the Lord said unto the children of Israel, did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines, the Zidonians and the Amalekites and the Mayanites did oppress you and ye cried to me and I delivered you out of their hand. God said, did I not just take care of you in all these situations? And he says, what? Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. History repeated itself. We've been talking about that. And Israel cried out for deliverance to God. But the Lord didn't send help immediately. Instead, he sent a messenger to people who rebuked them for their lack of appreciation for all that God had done for them. That's, a, you know, God, there's a messenger here. And he now, he said, I'm not going to help you anymore. If you want to help, go ask the God you've been worshiping to help you. Why isn't that the right statement on God's part? If you put your faith in something other than God, why should God pull you out of the ditch if you put your faith in something else? Why shouldn't God tell us, hey, you put all your faith in your money, let your money save you. You put all your faith over in that person, then let that person pull you out of the ditch. Why shouldn't God be angry at us for that? But yet we didn't think God would never do something like that. But sometimes he's going to let your wallet. Because remember, it says he didn't come immediately and save them. They went through 18 years of this. And they cried out to him. And eventually he does, he's grieved by their misery. There's a loving God for you. He wants to punish them, but eventually he gives in. But then he lets them be, he lets them be chastened. And he lets them go through it. Hoping that they'll do what? Learn the lesson. Sometimes as parents, we have to let the children face consequences. We can't rush in and fix everything for them all the time. But sometimes they have to face consequences. God's letting them feel the consequences of their decisions of forsaking him and worshiping false gods. They can't do nothing for them. And like I say, the people here have abandoned God. Now God's saying, oh, I'm abandoning you. Obviously, I'm sure that sent you know some eyebrows up saying, whoa, 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 wait a second, he's always come before. But like I say, this is not uncommon by God. Sometimes God lets people go. And he doesn't interfere with them. Let me share with you Romans 1, 24 through 28. That should be a familiar scripture for many of you. It says, wherefore God also gave them up to their to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this God get for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise the men also leaving their natural use a woman, burned in her lust towards another, men with men and working and that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind and to do, to do those things which are not convenient. Now, a lot of people read this and say this is all homosexuality. That is not totally true. 
it is an example. In this, there is the example of homosexuality it's talking about. But it's more than that. There's the uncleanness and the lust of their hearts. If your heart is set on material things, that's the lust of your heart. If your heart is set on the affections of a certain person, then that's the lust of your heart. If your heart is set on some particular whatever, that's the lust of your heart. And what is the lust of heart? And when that becomes what your driving force is, God is going to deal with you. Because following the lust of your heart, no matter what it is, if it's not, if you don't lust after God, then to serve God, to be with God, and if that's not the fulfillment of your heart, then you are rebelling against God, and God's going to let you, if you keep it up, live in it. He's going to let you go. So don't read this and say, oh, that's just for homosexuality or some kind of sexual immorality. Lust of the heart, all of those things, homosexual, all those things, derived from the same thing, lust of the heart. So whatever your lust is, you can drive yourself and have a reprimate mind. And God will let you go. He's gonna, he'll let you go. But this is a common example and this is the outward example that a lot of people see, and it's a vile one. And God uses it as an illustration because why? It breaks the, the, the setup of marriage. Because remember, marriage is one man and one woman. And this breaks that. And God's covenant is an example of a perfect marriage between a husband and a wife. And he uses that example. So this is a very non, um, this is something that goes against marriage. And it goes against the family. And it goes against so many things. So this is a good example that God would use. But at the key over here is the lust of their own heart. And then it says to dishonor their own body between themselves. And that goes into the physical side of that dishonor. But you can dishonor yourself through gluttony. Through anything that becomes your obsession and the lust of your heart. So I want you to understand that if, if material goods and money and that was is the lust of your heart, you can end up in this same situation. God will just say, "Let there go." If you have so much faith in it, you go with it. So be careful that you don't read that and try to list it down just to sexual immorality, because it's the heart that God's looking at, and what's true in your heart is where you are. So whether you're worshiping idols, and idols can be any of these images that we talk about. That's why God calls them a whoring after other idols, other gods. But money is an idol. You can make yourself an idol. You can make your house an idol, a car. You can do anything can be made into an idol. That's what you desire. Why would you desire anything other than God? Because you don't have your flesh under control. And we'll have a message coming up on that at some point. So, so like I say, and we've talked about before having your mind honoring Christ and having the mind of Christ. We talked about that in the recent message. So like I say, uh, so here, you know, the Jews finally said, okay, God, and they put away their false gods. And he said, do what you want. How many Christians fail to realize that they embrace the world more and more? And that's what Romans 1, 24 is saying. How many Christians, if they really recognize that they're embracing the world more and more and need to turn back to God? There are some that will never realize that they've gone down this path that's talked about in Romans 1, 24 through 28, following after the lust of their heart. They'll still say, oh, I'm a good Christian and all, but what they're pursuing is not God. They're pursuing their lust. And more and more Christians are embracing the world more and more and more. That's why the church's footprint and the church's impact on the world has become less because the Christians are not peculiar and we're not set apart in embracing the world as we should. As for Christians, we're embracing the world as the world embraces the world. We're not going after the world with love and you know, rec reconciliation to God. We're going after the world saying, hey, we want to fit in with you. And it don't work. 
You can't make that impact. So here, getting back to our scripture, Israelites hoped wasn't in their repenting or their praying, but in the character of God. It says God's soul was grieved. That's where their hope was. Israel's repenting and saying, putting away their gods, no impact on God. Because he knew their hearts. It was God's soul. It was God's soul that was afflicted. And he had the mercy on them. And all their affliction, he was afflicted. In Isaiah 63, 9. See, God feels for you. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them. For you are God and grace, for you are God and gracious. Nehemiah, and I'm talking about God being gracious and merciful. Gracious and merciful. Yet he was merciful and he atoned for their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time, he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. Psalm 78, 38. Time and time again, we see scriptures where God's anger would burn against Israel and then he turns around and out of his grace and his mercy and his love for him, he repents and he turns back from his wrath. Remember, Moses pleaded for God, hold back your wrath and all because things were not going as they should and God was going to wipe out Israel and Moses said, don't do that. Don't do that. So like I say, You have to be careful. Sorry about that. So like I say, so we should be able to see, really relieved as Christians saying, boy, it's so great that God's merciful and gracious and he'll pull back. But we shouldn't take that as advantage and say, oh, I can do as I please. God will let me go. I always remind you, God is righteous. God is holy. There's only so far back he can pull. And I assure you that those who died and did not follow God you know, and led Israel away from God and led him towards Balaam. I guarantee you he didn't say, well, you're forgiven and you're, you're okay. He let them feel it. And in the end, they'll face their judgment you know, if they never turn back to God. So like I say, be careful when you start saying, oh, God never let that happen. There are those who believe that God will never let us all go to hell. I've heard them talk about in theology and whatnot. Oh, God was, he's merciful with grace. He'd never let anybody suffer in hell. And that's where they come up with this thing of purgatory. He'd let them suffer for a little bit, but then he'd pull them back out. There is no such thing as purgatory. There's not a temporary holding place and then you get to go on to heaven after you pay your price. No. You're either saved by the blood and you're going to heaven or you're not and you're going to hell for eternity when you die. And it's not that God's sending you to hell, it's that you have chosen it. And you are chosen that that is what you want because you have rejected salvation. When we reject salvation, we are choosing our destiny. When we reject the Savior, Jesus Christ, we are choosing that we want Satan and we want to endure with him. When he's cast in a lake of fire, we want to go with him. You might say, well, I don't want to worship Satan. I'm not a Satan worshiper. You can't be nothing. Satan will try to convince you, oh, being nothing, you're safe. It doesn't work out well. There's no middle ground with God. You're either a believer or you're not. Don't let Satan lie to you and deceive you thinking you're okay. You don't go to church, but you're a good person. You don't need to worry about anything. Don't ever let Satan fool you with that. Good people go to hell. Bad people go to hell. People who claim to be Christians that have never been saved go to hell. And it's not by God desiring that they do. It's by God letting them choose to go there. And that decision is made when they reject Jesus. Be careful in your decisions. So like I say, God is righteous. So moving on into verses 17 and 18, we're going to continue and wrap up. 
And the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and the princes of Gilead said one another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now, Ammon assembled himself, and the people of the armies, they say, okay, of Israel say, we're going to go up and fight against them. We're going to defend ourselves. And like I say, the people were prepared to act, but, but from all the tribes of Israel, there was nobody there to lead. They didn't have a judge at this time. They didn't have a general, a commander to lead. Now, whether in a nation or a local church, the absence of qualified leaders is often a judgment of God. Think about that. You want to lead people in chaos? Just don't give me leaders. You want to let people just keep turning over and turning over and being wrapped up in their own desires and their own will? Fine, if that's what they want, just don't give any leaders to get them out of it. Israel has no leaders here. And it is evidence of the low spiritual level of the people. Now, when the Spirit is at work with believers, he will equip and call servants to accomplish his will and to bless his people. That's part of what we talked about for another Bible says. When you are following God and you're doing the things of God and you're working towards the things of God, he will provide you with resources. And part of the resources he will provide you with is leadership. The other thing is manpower and women power, you know, whatever you want to call it. He will provide you with the resources you need to accomplish that which is his will. He will not say, this is what I want you to do. You go figure out how. God doesn't work that way. If he puts you on task, he's going to provide for that task. You're going to have the tools and equipment you need, so to speak. And if you need leadership to help you accomplish the will of God, then God will send the church leadership. Israel has no leadership here. They're at a low in their spiritual walk. John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy wrote this in his book, Profiles and Courage. We the people are the boss. And we will get the kind of political leadership, be it good or bad, that we demand and deserve. Notice what he says. We'll get what we demand and deserve. I smirked when I read it. I couldn't help myself. I thought, wow, what a perfect image of our political scene today. We have a nation that is not in unity. We have so many different subgroups and political groups and personal agendas and all this stuff. How do we expect to get a leader that's going to round all that up and make it all right when we ourselves don't want it? Because too many people are out there saying, I want this. The thought of having a nation united saying this is what we, the people, want for the good of the nation, it's gone. Our political system is supposed to protect us from that, but when we become so divided, what's going to happen? We're going to get the leadership we demand and deserve. And sometimes you say, well, I didn't deserve that leadership or I didn't deserve that person. Oh, it's just an example of God's justice. We're going to get what we deserve. It's a judgment here on earth, not a end time type of judgment. But God is going to let the people. He's on, it's just like, you know, Israel wanted a king. So what did God do? He, he, he said, no, you don't want a king. Oh, we want a king. And he says, well, if you have a king, he's going to do this, this, and this, and this. And they said, that's okay. We want a king. So he gave him Saul. Saul was not the best thing for Israel. King Saul got him into trouble. And eventually it became an issue. They got what they deserved. They got a king that fit the description that they wanted and not a king who God wanted for them. So what's true of political leadership is often true of spiritual leadership. We get what we deserve. When the church is out of God's will and not doing the things at all, we wonder why are these things happening in the church? Why is our leadership letting this happen? Guess what? You're getting what you deserve. 
That's what you're demanding. If we're not all pulling in the same direction, then how can God give us leadership that will lead us in that direction if we don't want to go in that direction and we want to pull away and go our own separate ways? When, people, when God's people are submitted to him and serving him, he sends them the gifted servants to instruct and lead them. But when their appetite turns to things of the world and flesh, he judges them by depriving them of good and godly leaders. The righteous perish and no one ponders it in his heart. That's in Isaiah 57. 1. So here, like I say, we wrap this up. 18 years of suffering Israelites assembled to face their oppressors. They have no leadership. And they have no one to be the general for their army. In order to get a volunteer to command the leaders of Israel, what they're saying is we'll come together and whoever steps forward and leads our army and leads the victory, we'll make them the head of Gilead. They had princes of Israel and Israel called a prayer meeting and they, we would call this a political caucus because they, they didn't seek God's will. They said, this is what we're going to do. In an interesting, when people get together and they say, this is what we're going to do without consulting God. And we'll see what all happens with this as we get into it next time. I want to share this short story, Warren Wiersbe, um, one I use for outlines with our Bible study. They, he says a young Christian he had an evangelist preach a powerful sermon on the text, where is the Lord God of Elijah? That comes out of 2 Kings 2 and 14. We know where the Lord God of Elijah is, he said. He's on the throne of heaven and is just as powerful today as he was in Elijah's day. Then he paused. The question is not so much where is the Lord God of Elijah as is where are the Elijahs? Are we Elijahs or are we not? Are we those that God can pick up and use in spiritual leadership and do the things that, that, you know, to rally his people? Are you able to be used by God to confront the evils of the world that surround us and afflict the church? Think about that. The God of Elijah is still there. Where's the Elijah's? So like I say, that really, we've finished up chapter 10. It never ceases me how the Old Testament speaks to today. I hope that you picked out some things out of this, you know, golden nuggets as one minister used to call them to me. But how we choose to make our decisions, what we lust after that drives us is such a big role in our life. And I would be amazed by the number of people. I, I wouldn't be amazed, really. I probably wouldn't. But I think it may amaze some of you if you'd really sit down and examine your heart. Why did I make that decision today? Was it because it was according to God's word and it's what he's taught me in scripture? Or is it because that would, would profit me and whatever it is I value most? Where is your heart? Where is the lust of your heart? What are you basing your decisions on? Are you crying out to God in, in your troubles? Or are you worshiping all the days long? Think on it. We saw where God is and judges. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Father, we give you the glory and Father, guide us and direct us. And Father, we just want to do your will. But Father, we have to be doers of your will, not just knowers. And Father, let us make decisions based on your word and your will for our lives and you being the most important thing in our lives. Father, let us not let the lust of our hearts be anything other than you. And Father, let us understand that the God of Elijah is still on the throne. Let us be Elijah's. Those willing servants that can do great things as being led and used by God. Watch over us and keep us, and may we get back together again, bring us out to our Sunday morning service, and 
other Bible studies on the internet, Lord, but just bless us and guide us. Watch over each and every one. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, and have a blessed evening.